Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Friday morning program. Um, I am uh, thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Ho, who has um, been featured on this program in the past. Um, and Alan really needs no introduction, as um, those of you involved in um, either head, neck, or thyroid cancer, or both, um, are aware that he is a head, neck medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, with uh, um, involvement in translational research, both in thyroid cancers, salivary cancers, and developmental therapeutics. Uh, he is currently working um, as the leader of the Head and Neck Working Group in the Alliance for Clinical Trials and Oncology and the Head and Neck Section of the International Rare Cancer Initiative. He is also a member of the board of the International Thyroid Oncology Group and NCI Head and Neck Steering Committee. We are also joined this morning by Dr. Frank Warden, uh, who is a medical oncologist at the University of Mission, uh, Michigan Rogel Cancer Center. He is a clinical investigator, both in head and neck, as well as multidisciplinary lung cancer. Um, his research interests include organ preservation, both in head and neck and endocrine oncology. As always, we encourage um, all of our listeners to uh, send in questions. Um, and we will try to get to as many of those as we possibly can before the end of the hour. And so without um, taking any further time here, um, it's a pleasure to turn over uh, the program to Dr. Ho and um, again, encourage all of you to send in your questions. Thanks, Alan. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, really happy to be here with all of you. Let me just share my screen and... Um... I believe that that should be good. So yeah, no, I really uh, appreciated being a part of these uh, sessions. So really happy to be here again. Uh, you know, so for this journal club, uh, this is really, uh, we're gonna discuss the outcomes of our randomized phase three trial, looking at how uh, cellumentin may or may not be able to improve the outcomes of patients with higher risk thyroid cancers in the set of adjuvant radioactive iodine. This was ultimately a negative study, which we'll, we'll review. And so what I thought I would do is kind of talk about redifferentiation generally, <clears throat> as well as um, uh, the, the data leading up to the trial, uh, lessons learned from the study. Uh, and then after that, kind of more updated data, clinical data from uh, redifferentiation that maybe inform future studies and, and future attempts uh, at these type of studies, at these type of trials. And here are my uh, disclosures. Uh, this is an AstraZeneca study, and indeed I've researched, uh, received research funding and have been a consultant for AstraZeneca in the past. So when we discuss redifferentiation, I don't have to um, explain this to, to this audience, but obviously the, the, the idea here is, uh, was it really originated in patients with recurrent metastatic incurable thyroid cancers that were uh, refractory to radioactive iodine? Uh, whether it's uh, the inability to take up radioactive iodine or resistance to radioactive iodine therapies, and whether or not we could use targeted therapies to improve the uptake, incorporation, trapping of radioactive iodine, its effectiveness in this um, poor prognostic population. And so in terms of the biology here, um, of course, the degree to which thyroid cancers are able to uptake and incorporate radioactive iodine really relies on how much they retain the expression of the biochemical machinery that's involved in thyroid hormone biosynthesis. And of course, predominantly how much expression of sodium iodine symporter is there. So this determines, of course, the, the degree of uptake of radioactive iodine that we uh, visualize uh, in, in thyroid cancers, but the ability to trap and retain it also has to do with the expression of genes that are important for iodine organic organification, all regulated under uh, the TSH uh, receptor. And of course, as all of us know, that even in the most well-differentiated thyroid cancers, the degree to which the, this biochemical machinery is retained and the ability to take a radioactive iodine really is fractions of what we see in, in the th normal thyroid gland. And the main reason for that um, has been delineated by a series of preclinical studies that have been done by the group here at Memorial, led by Jim Fagan and, and many others that have demonstrated that the MAP kinase pathway which is the central oncogenic pathway for most uh, follicular cell-derived thyroid cancers, activation of that pathway is not only important for in increasing tumor pro cell proliferation and survival, but also can suppress the expression of these very genes that are important for taking up radioactive iodine. And so the primary hypothesis that's been built on these, these preclinical observations uh, 
is that the high MAP kinase activity of thyroid cancers is what leads to radioactive iodine refractoriness. And since the development of selective inhibitors to this pathway, could we utilize these drugs to inhibit MAP kinase activity and inversely increase the expression of those thyroid specific genes to improve rate of incorporation and, and convert re refractory patients to more sensitive patients. And so the proof of principle study that was done initially was with the drug selumetinib, which is the feature drug in today's article as well. Selumetinib is developed as a highly selective allosteric inhibitor of MEK1 and 2, which is downstream of both RAS and BRAF, the two predominant mutations in follicular cell-derived thyroid cancers that leads to the constitutive activation of that pathway. And so the original idea behind this, uh, the, the, the initial pilot trial is, could we take selumetinib treat uh, patients with RA refractory thyroid cancers and restore radioactive iodine avidity and efficacy in, in that population. And to measure that in the initial study, we used I-124 PET CT lesional dosimetry, which allows us to go lesion to lesion and quantify uh, 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 rigorously the changes on iodine uptake that we observed in these patients. And in this initial pilot, it was really, the primary objective was really to look and see how many of these patients could we improve iodine avidity uh, in those tumors. The schema of, of our refractory protocols are depicted here, and they're all generally similar in terms of doing a baseline I went to a PET scan, followed by four weeks of, uh, of therapy, in this case, selimetinib in the initial pilot. And then that last week, repeating the I went to a PET scan and assessing are there differences in our in RAI uptake with drug therapy? And if they met a specific lesional dosimetry criteria, they, those patients would then go on to get radioactive iodine and then stop all therapy and we'd monitor for response with thyroglobulins and, and CT scans up to six months. And those that don't were, would come off the trial. And so what we found is that a subset of the patients on that initial study with selumetinib could improve radioactive iodine uptake. This was one among a more of the dramatic cases where a patient with completely REI had negative uh, lung metastases had conversion to positive. This was actually a BRAF mutant patient. Um, and among the 20 patients, ultimately 12 had some new or increased iodine uptake seen on the, on the, on the second PET scan but only a subset of those met the lesional dosimetry criteria that we thought was worthwhile proceeding with radioactive iodine. That was eight patients uh, out of those 12. And if you broke it down by histology, even though the preclinical data was really based in BRAF mutant disease rather than others, you can see that um, although there were only five RAS mutant patients, more of the RAS mutant patients seemed to reach that lesional dosimetry criteria compared to the BRAF mutant patients. So even though four out of nine had some new, <coughs> new or increased activity, only one of those nines went on to receive radioactive iodine, and those that were BRAF RAS wild but did not have a RAS or BRAF mutation was sort of somewhere in between. So the conclusions from that pilot study was, okay, in the refractory space, um, you could convert a subset of those patients uh, to have iodine avidity and to increase uh, radioactive iodine efficacy, and it may be broken down to some degree by, uh, by genetic status. So having proven that, uh, that this can occur in the more challenging setting of refractory, RI refractory thyroid cancers, the idea behind ASTRA or this phase three trial was, could we then utilize this approach for redifferentiation in the post-operative space in patients with higher risk disease and improve their complete remission rates? So, you know, in comparison to the two settings where redifferentiation has been evaluated, both in that initial trial and in subsequent studies, there are, of course, differences in the way that uh, radioactive iodine is utilized. So here, you know, radioactive iodine has no role in the refractory space, whereas in those patients with, who were treating with adjuvant radioactive iodine in the postoperative space, there's, there's obviously a standard role. The, the intention of the treatment in, in, uh, ref, in, in, in refractory recurrent metastatic disease is the administration of drugs or therapies with palliative intent, shrinkage or control of disease, whereas there is really an incurative intent or at least an intent to prevent uh, persistent and recurrent disease happening postoperatively. Um, ultimately though, the research of postoperative radioactive iodine is based upon uh, retrospective data. There really hasn't been a prospective clinical trial proving the adjuvant benefit of radioactive iodine in this space. And the disease that you're treating, of course, is different in these two settings, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where it's gross measurable tumors that you can see on scans in our refractory recurrent mastectomy disease patients whereas we presumably are treating microscopic disease in the postoperative setting and hopefully improving complete remission after that. And then one of the presumptions that, was, that went into the design of the trial 
is that um, whereas the refractory permanent metastatic disease patients have more advanced stage disease, um, have more um, uh, disease that over time has accumulated more uh, genetic alterations, but that the disease that we would be encountering in the locally advanced setting would be genetically more simple, more differentiated uh, at baseline, and presumably more amenable to redifferentiation approaches. And so these are some of the assumptions and uh, um, uh, presuppositions before the trial design. <clears throat> so here's the design of the phase three uh, trial that we'll be discussing today. And the idea here was really first that we had to identify a, a a patient population who, based upon pathologic criteria, would be at higher risk of not achieving biochemical and structural complete remission after surgery uh, and standard radioactive iodine. And this was really based upon the risk stratification work of Mike Tuttle, who used retrospective analyses from a variety of different databases to identify some of these key criteria, which have now entered into the ATA guidelines for uh, risk stratification. Um, and so for this particular trial, what we were looking for with patients who had primary tumors that are greater than four centimeters or had gross extrathyroidal extension or clinically significant lymph node disease, which was defined as even either having a lymph, a lymph nodes of uh, a centimeter greater uh, or, um, I'm sorry, uh, or having five or more lymph nodes in total. So any one of these criteria would have made you eligible postoperatively uh, for consideration of this clinical trial. We had to exclude, of course, patients with known distant metastases. So if you had residual disease after the surgery or known distant metastases, this was not the patient population we were looking for because this was really an adjuvant uh, treatment uh, approach. So the primary endpoint here, so this was a phase three registration trial. So before um, we uh, activated in Windsor Roman, there were a variety of dis different discussions with the FDA, presuming that if um, this were a positive trial, what would be the endpoint that they would accept as being clinically acceptable, as, as clinically significant for an FDA approval? And so, you know, one of the, you know, one of the positives or accomplishments of the trial was really establishing this new registration endpoint that the FDA uh, ultimately accepted, which was biochemical and structural complete remission rate at 18 months. And the reason why 18 months was selected is, again, based upon Dr. Tuttle's prior work looking at risk stratifications, that by 18 months, 94% of all patients who will ultimately achieve biochemical complete remission will have achieved it at 18 months. And of course, one of the reasons why we had to use this kind of surrogate endpoint is still in this patient population, most patients' so overall survival is quite excellent. And so really the benefits of complete remission rate at 18 months is not only improvement of survival in these patients, in these patients, even though the, the rates of mortality are quite low, but also in <clears throat> improving uh, the relapse or recurrence uh, rates by achieving complete remission, um, as well as um, decreasing the need for frequency of monitoring and other treatments. And so making those arguments about improvement survival, relapse rates, and uh, the need for uh, future treatments and monitoring um, the FDA accepted the complete remission rate at 18 months as a viable registration endpoint and one representative of clinical benefit. So using that primary endpoint and those high-risk criteria that I just listed above, um, based upon Dr. Tuttle's and other people's work uh, on, on risk stratification, they anticipated that patients having any one of those four criteria would achieve uh, the, the, that the complete remission rate at 18 months would be about 30%, meaning 70% of the patients by that point would have had some evidence of disease by 18 months, either biochemical or structural. So assuming that, and then designing this trial with uh, AstraZeneca, the idea was, well, what is gonna be alternative hypothesis? What are we gonna be going for? What are we gonna, what are we gonna assume uh, to be uh, a clinically significant improvement in those outcomes? And so um, this was actually uh, a, a trial where we we're going uh, for a pretty ambitious target of improving that 30% number to 50% with adding selimentinib to postoperative radioactive iodine. And that was done for several reasons. So the first was, uh, the thought was that by adding additional adjuvant therapy, we really wanted to see a big benefit doing that because obviously you're exposing patients to additional risks when you're adding drug treatment in the adjuvant setting. And the second was, this was the first study of its kind. And so um, it would feasibility of being able to execute this, and we'll talk about this more in, when we go into the data, was really unknown at the time. Uh, 
And so um, the idea was that we that um, we would only be able to move forward with this if we kept the overall sample size quite manageable. And that for a phase three trial, this ultimately enrolled and and read and randomized two hundred thirty three patients, which is an incredibly small number for a phase three study. So with with those things in mind, those were that was the primary endpoint. The secondary endpoints was then looking at completion complete remission rates among patients with BRAF and RAS mutations. And then the second was clinical remission rate, and I'll kind of get into this in the next slide. But because the, the, this was a, a registration trial, the FDA required us to prove complete remission at 18 months by not only conventional biochemical and structural criteria, but also additional imaging criteria. And so there was, in, in this way, there was a heavy kind of diagnostic burden to proving that the patients at 18 months really didn't have any evidence of disease. So that was the primary endpoint. Uh, but as a secondary endpoint, we wanted to know, well, you know, what were the remission rates if measured just by using what we typically use in standard of care to uh, ascertain that patients were free of disease? And of course, safety and tolerability of the approach. So with that in mind, uh, patients uh, uh, who had differentiated thyroid cancers meeting any of the, one of these four criteria after having undergone a total thyroidectomy were re then randomized two to one to the experimental arm which was selumetinib, uh, 75 milligrams BID for four weeks, or placebo for four weeks, followed by, after four weeks of therapy, thyrogen-stimulated uh, radioactive iodine uh, in both arms. Uh, and so the only difference between these two arms is whether you got placebo or selumetinib with standard radioactive iodine. Now, as we were designing the study, of course, there was a lot of uh, discussion about what the dose of postoperative radioactive iodine would be. And of course, this was an international study with you know, 42 different centers um, and uh, eight different countries. So uh, ultimately, it was decided that, that we would do the empiric dose of 100 millicuries or 3.7 gigabit corals uh, for postoperative radioactive iodine in this trial. And after that, um, all therapy stopped. And then patients would put on regular surveillance as dictated by protocol, which was a little bit more heightened than you know, usual standard monitoring. But the primary endpoint assessment comes 18 months after the radioactive iodine was given. And we'll kind of go through the assessments that were done as well as um, um, a final follow-up after three years. So um, let me just move this here. So this is kind of the schema for assessment of complete remission at 18 months. So essentially the criteria that would perform in the protocol is in order to be de declared free of disease at 18 months, you had to have a negative uh, uh, stimulated thyroglobulin with no evidence of thyroglobulin antibodies, okay? So if you had thyroglobulin antibodies before study entry, you were not eligible for the trial actually. You had to have a negative thyrogen stimulated scintigraphy scan you had to have a negative neck ultrasound. And then beyond that, because it was a registration trial and because the neck ultrasounds can be uh, user dependent, the FDA required that we also prove patients were free of disease by doing the MRI of the neck and CT scan of the chest. So that's a lot of different assessments. So in order to kind of minimize the burden among patients, the way that the 18 month assessments were done uh, was really in a staged way. So if you, proved to be, have failed to be in complete remission at any one of the first three stages, you didn't have to go on to get the assessments in the, sec in the subsequent stages, really to save patients from having to get too many assessments. So, you know, stage one was really looking at suppressed TG uh, and TG antibodies and doing the neck ultrasounds, okay? So obviously if you had evidence of biochemical um, or structural persistence or recurrent disease at that point, you would just stop. If you were free of disease at that stage, then you would go on to thyrogen stimulated assessments, which was um, uh, the whole body scans and then the thyroglobins and thyroglobin antibodies. And if you cleared that, then you went on to get your CT scan, the chest and MRI of the neck and proved that, that you were complete remission. So this was the staged approach that the, the trial uses. You can tell is quite, uh, quite involved and cumbersome for an initial trial uh, of this type. So here's kind of um, the way enrollment went. So ultimately 400 patients were uh, consented, 167 patients were excluded. So there was 160 patients who screen failed. The vast majority of these screen fails was the detection of thyroglobulin antibodies. So again, because we were using thyroglobulin as one of the surrogates for outcomes here, um, if you had uh, detectable antibodies, we can reliably follow your thyroglobins, you weren't eligible for the trial. 
And ultimately, 233 went into that two to one randomization, 155 into the selumetinib arm, 78 patients into the placebo arm, and ultimately 204 completed uh, treatment, 83% of the patients in the selumetinib arm uh, and 97% in the placebo arm. And this lower rate of completion had to do with drug toxicity, as we'll talk about. So there was a slight uh, fa a favoring of, 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 uh, of female patients over male uh, in, the, in the trial uh, generally. Um, if you look at all the distributions of these different demographic features and tumor characteristics, they were all quite matched. Uh, the majority of patients had papillary uh, carcinoma um, and the majority of patients had T3 tumors and had uh, clinically evident nodal disease. So what was not required in study entry was the genetics of the tumor. This was done post hoc. And actually 205 of the patients ultimately had tissues that were available for genetic profiling. And when we looked, 60% um, of the patients had a BRAF V600E mutation. And then a lower percentage of patients had NRAS or HRAS. And uh, you know, less than 10% had some kind of RNA fusion, whether it be the Paxa P par gamma fusion, REC fusions, or interact fusions. So these really re represented the minority of the patients, the vast majority, and then not the vast majority, the majority of patients had BRAF V6 or 3 mutations. So the in terms of the primary endpoint, as I mentioned in the beginning, this ultimately, unfortunately, was a negative study. So when we looked at the complete remission rate at 18 months, in the placebo group, it turned out 38.5% of the patients uh, at the 18-month time point achieved complete remission, compared to just 40% with selumetinib with an odds ratio of 1.07, that obviously did not meet statistical significance. So nowhere near the kind of absolute increases that we were looking for. Now, one of the uh, predefined subsets that we wanted to look at, so this assessment was done in the intention to treat patient population. So, um, and so you take in consideration all the data points of the patients who were randomized. One of the predefined uh, patient uh, subsets was this treatment compliant analysis set. So, um, what we wanted to do was uh, analyze outcomes in the patients who were compliant with treatment during what we called the critical period, which was at least seven days before radioactive iodine, the day of radioactive iodine, and two days afterwards. And among the patients who were on placebo or drug at that time, um, there was a slight widening of benefit with selumetinib, 46.7% 46, 46 versus 37.5% of complete remission rate at 18 months with a hazard ratio of 1.46. But again, did not reach statistical significance. So the, pay, so the trial was negative by both, of these, by both of these endpoints. So we looked also at a variety of different tumor characteristics, genetic characteristics to try to see if there were any other trends in benefit, you know, whether it be BRAF, RAS status, histology, age, sex, uh, or ethnicity. And just the two things to point out is when we looked at the BRAF mutant patient population, uh, there really was absolutely no benefit among the BRAF mutant patients. In fact, the 36% the complete remission rate among the, the selumetinib arm versus the placebo arm of 37%, um, and, and sort of the opposite in the ones without detection of BRAF mutations. And just one curious finding was that there was a trend towards benefit among male patients, but not so much among female patients. Really hard to understand why that would be. Um, and um, and then obviously these are all kind of subset analyses and supposed to be hypothesis generating. Uh, and I'm not really sure why that this, this trend existed, but just to point out that this was one of the one of the only kind of factors where there were uh, there appeared to be um, some at least uh, interested trends uh, towards benefit or, or lack of benefit. The other issue with the trial was as I went through, there was great complexity in the way that Treatments had to be administered the way that uh, complete remissions had to be analyzed. And indeed, this was the first of its kind of, of its trial where you really had to involve surgeons, nuclear medicine folks, endocrinologists, and even medical oncologists, a very multidisciplinary trial. So even in the beginning, there, it was a very cumbersome trial to, to, and difficult trial to run. Um, and there was, a, there was a very steep learning curve. Although, you know, as, as the trial went on, as many of you may have participated, um, that, that did get smoothed out. But in terms of reasons why we called patients not in complete remission, both in the selumet and the placebo arm, the minority of those calls was evidence of structural recurrence. The second would be biochemical recurrence was more common, but really the most common was really the fact that patients were not being assessed at the 18 months uh, the way that the protocol mandated. And so 
the way that the protocol was designed and written is that if you fail to get your 18 month assessments in the way that the protocol was designed, you were automatically called a failure. And so you could see that that represented 23% of the patients in the placebo arm, and in fact, 32% of the patients in the selimentinib arm. And then the other issue, of course, is toxicity. You know, so as you can imagine, there are many, there's more toxicity seen in the patients who receive selimentinib versus placebo. And when you look at the list of toxicities that the patients experience, they were all kind of consistent with MEK inhibitor toxicities, including rash, diarrhea, fatigue, and nausea, and CPK increases. There were low rates of grade three toxicities, but ultimately the 16% of the patients had some kind of grade three or higher toxicity that led to dose interruptions in 21% and 27% dose reductions. And ultimately 12% of the patients in the selumetinib arm did discontinue the drug due to an adverse event. Seven were due to rash. And a class effect of MEK inhibitors is blurred vision or retinal detachment. Four of the patients had, that, uh, had one of those ophthalmologic AEs, all of which recovered after, you, after the drugs were stopped. And then there were three deaths seen on the study after treatment was done more than 30 days later. Two of them, those deaths were in the placebo arm due to thyroid cancer and stroke, and one was in, seen in the cellular network due to the thyroid cancer. So none of these were drug-related, but just to, to mention that uh, from the death perspective, uh, those were the numbers. So the conclusions from the trial was that the addition of selumetinib to radioactive iodine does not improve complete remission rate in the, this patient population at higher risk of primary treatment failure by biochemical and structural criteria. Um, just to highlight that this was actually the first study that, that we're aware of that tried to evaluate the efficacy of any adjuvant therapy, including radioactive iodine for complete, improving complete remission rate. And that the, one of the accomplishments of the trial in, in retrospect was that the 18 month complete remission rate is now a new registration at point that can be accepted by regulatory authorities based upon its association with relapse free and disease specific for survival and the avoidance of future treatments, et cetera. And we also found that risk stratification by those pathological criteria does indeed identify a cohort of patients for whom standard surgery radioactive iodine does not achieve complete biochemical complete uh, structural remission at 18 months. The number was not as low as was seen in the retrospective study, so that might have impacted upon the power of the study to detect those differences. And again, because of uh, some of the uh, missing assessments at 18 months and calling those patients as failures, you know, it may be even a little bit higher, but we know that at least less than half of the uh, patients uh, uh, conservatively did not achieve complete remission on the trial. And, um, and it also highlights the importance uh, of what we need more of, which is one of the bottom line conclusions from this, that we need more larger randomized trials to really prove the benefit of redifferentiation approaches, whether in this setting or in other settings. And so I thought I would take just the remainder of like the next 10 to 15 minutes uh, to, to also highlight not only uh, the, the lessons learned from Astra, but also what subsequent redifferentiation trials have taught us about this approach and how it might influence the design of future studies. So again, when we're looking retrospectively at this, one of the issues with the trial was that we were really looking for a very ambitious improvement in, in, in outcomes, which was a 20% increase in cure. Now, from a clinical standpoint, you might say that that actually would be quite reasonable because we really want to see tremendous benefit if we're adding any type of side effects or inconvenience to the patients in, in their treatments. Um, but it is a high bar to clear. Toxicity was an issue with, with selumetinib. And indeed, you know, we just need better tolerated drugs. And some of the more targeted approaches we've uh, uh, assessed in our refractory space may fit that bill, but all the drugs have toxicity. So this is something that needs to be, we need to be wary of. By definition, this was a complicated trial design, both because of the way that, uh, because uh, no trials have ever been performed in this space pr previously, as well as the requirements that the FDA put on, uh, on, the, on the study teams in order to prove complete remission. Having said that, the secondary endpoint of clinical complete remission, which is simply looking at thyroglobulins and neck ultrasounds and whole body scans, uh, track very well with um, uh, with the complete remission criteria that was used as a primary endpoint. So future studies can use more simplified complete remission criteria and it, it appears that those things are congruent. And one of the very key things that we've learned uh, as well is that um, matching the genotype of the tumor to the drug that you're using is quite important for getting good outcomes, at least in the RA refractory space. Uh, 
And so the fact that over half of the patients have BRAF mutations where MEK inhibitors can work, but don't work as well as other targeted approaches was probably also another contributing factor to the outcomes that we observed. And what we see in the RA refractory space is that when you have BRAF mutant tumors, that MAP kinase output is much higher. So you really require more potent drugs or more selective drugs to kind of inhibit that activity than say RAS mutation patients. So future trials, any trials that we do really have to have genetic selection. And so, you know, some of these lessons learned are from the RA refractory trials that have been done subsequently. Um, and it's really primarily about how we match the uh, genotype to the drugs that we use. Again, as I mentioned, with BRAF mut mutations, BRAF inhibitors and those that selectively inhibit that node would, would be preferred. And one of the advantages of those, that class of drugs for those tumors is the fact that the therapeutic window is so much hot, is so much wider for those, for those tumors than it is with MEK inhibitors. And so we have done a, a pilot study of 10 patients with BRAF mutant disease with the BRAF inhibitor benadorafenib. And if you compare side by side in very small numbers, you know, better rates of redifferentiation. Still, as you see, it's only four out of 10. So there's still a, a population of refractory patients that don't achieve that uh, redifferentiation. And we're looking at the factors of why that might be. And I won't belabor this slide, but what, what we essentially did also in that trial is in serial biopsies, what we found is that we confirmed that you can inhibit MAP kinase input with femirafinib in these tumors. And that led to the re-expression of those genes I showed in that initial cartoon. Uh, so the, that biologic paradigms and the way the drugs works were really uh, validated in, in, in this particular trial. When you look side by side by all the BRAF inhibitor redifferentiation studies that have been done to date, uh, here are all of them. This is the original MEK inhibitor cohort, as I showed you, where only one of nine received radioactive iodine with one partial response. There was a debrafenib study by, done by uh, the MGH group led by Lori Worth, showing 60% went on to receive radioactive iodine. Now, I should also mention when we do these side by side comparisons, the way that redifferentiation was assessed, the way that radioactive iodine was administered, the duration of drug treatments, there was a lot of variability here. So this is really just to kind of give you a viewpoint of what's been done in, with, in, at different institutions. Uh, this is the Benmurafenib study I showed you. And then there are a series of more recent studies looking at combinations with BRAF inhibitors, primarily BRAF, combined BRAF MEK inhibition with debrafenib, trametinib, um, and showing um, uh, you know, higher rates of redifferentiation and response and our own kind of combination study in a very small pilot with a HER3 inhibitor. So the trend here is really using BRAF inhibitors for BRAF mutant drugs and the possibility, although we don't know for sure, the possibility that combining with different agents might improve redifferentiation rates. For RAS mutant disease where MEK inhibitors uh, were, uh, appear to be effective with selimetinib, you know, we, we just reported ASCO this year in RAS mutant RA refractory patients treated with trametinib versus a smaller cohort of patients without BRAF or RAS mutations, what were their outcomes with this more potently, potent uh, MEK inhibitor, uh, uh, trametinib, looking at clinical efficacy endpoints for the RAS mutant patients, PFS at six months and overall response at six months. And one of the things to recognize is that in the BRAF mutant cohort, those are very homogeneous patients in terms of radioactive ionavidity. Almost all those patients will have completely negative REI, REI negative tumors on scans. When you look at these RAS mutant cohorts, however, they're a much more heterogeneous patient population. So while almost all of them had at least one negative tumor on the initial I went to learn for PET scan, also many of them, uh, the majority of them had uh, at least one lesion that had some evidence of RI uptake and only four patients that were completely negative. And these are the variety of RAS mutations and, and non-RAS mutations that were treated. And so ultimately, what we found in this bigger cohort of patients was that 15 out of the 25 paid RAS mutant patients we treated qualified for radioactive iodine and went on to get dosimetry guided radioactive iodine therapy. And uh, among those 15, 14 ultimately consented to give radioactive iodine, leading to a 32% response rate with this approach. So this is all comers, whether you've got radioactive iodine or not. Um, there were 12% of patients before the six month time point that had progressive disease. So again, you know, how we select by patients clinically as well as biologically is important. And here's the waterfall plots at six months achieved at those patients with the patients with PR in green and then uh, stable disease in blue and, and progressive disease in red. So there have also been, in addition to our study, been other studies using trametinib as well in similar patient populations and, you know, with uh, successful redifferentiation rates, but there's some variability. And again, I think this is key in terms of how patients were clinically selected, 
the, you know, the RA fracture criteria that was utilized, the genetics that were, were used as well. Um, and so, you know, more studies in terms of like understanding uh, how to enrich for patient benefit uh, in the setting is, is, is definitely warranted. Um, and then um, just to kind of give you a flavor, in the, in, the, in the cohort B, these were the patients who didn't have BRAP mutations or, or, or RAS mutations. And it turns out they had these class two non-BRAP B600E uh, e mutations. These are BRAP mutations um, that are best treated with uh, MEK inhibitors. And we saw a really high rate of redifferentiation among that group um, and with three out of four of them getting radioactive iodine. MEK inhibitors for refugians do not work. You know, uh, so we only had one out of four, and then this STK11 mutant patients uh, did not benefit. And so among the patients who got treated, you know, there was one partial response in that cohort, uh, three with stable disease by six months um, with, you know, so good, good tumor control rates at six months, but one partial response with radioactive So as I mentioned, you know, the MEK inhibitor didn't work as well in the RET uh, setting. Again, going back to this idea of matching drugs to genotype, uh, there are now a variety of case series and case reports demonstrating that for the less frequent rearrangements, and now with the advent of these really selective potent inhibitors, uh, that matching drug to genotype is important here with, good re with some impressive examples of redifferentiation in track rearrangements with track inhibitors or RET rearrangements treated with uh, RET inhibitors. And so it, it's just more of the same in terms of the paradigms in which you really have to be selective with the drugs you're using based upon the genotype that you're treating. And indeed, Lord Worth is, is, is going to be leading a trial looking at self catnip as a redifferentiation agent in rearranged re arranged RF factory thyroid cancer patients. The other thing besides just the genotype is really better understanding how we select the patients, you know, whether it's in the refractory space or we do another adjuvant study, like which of these patients are going to, can we select for to enrich for benefit? And just to kind of illustrate the issue here, as I mentioned, this is from our venurafenib study. At baseline, the I-124 PET scans are almost homogeneously negative, as you can see, for any iodine uptake. And then when you treat with venurafenib, you do get an increased in new uptake. But as you can see, there's a heterogeneous effect you know, when we measure it with the I-124 PET scans. And so how do we define which of these completely negative tumors will end up up here versus down here? Um, and one of the things is like, well, you know, it, beyond REI avidity, are there markers of differentiation we can use? And what we found was that in the group that qualified for radioactive iodine, the baseline suppressed TGs were much higher, were statistically significantly higher than those who didn't. And so obviously TG being a thyroid specific gene, this was one gross marker in this particular setting that suggested, well, maybe this is a differentiation market that could predict benefit. Now, this is not gonna be a terribly useful one for clinical use, but it was a proof of principle that there are maybe markers that we should be looking for that reflect differentiation status to help us better select patients who will benefit. And also we're learning more about not only the driver mutations, but also the co-occurring mutations that might correlate to resistance or susceptibility. And so one of the um, recently published papers on Jim Fagan's group was that the co-occurring alteration of swipe SNP uh, 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 genes, these are epigenetic modifiers of chromatin accessibility uh, that include ARID1A, SMARC-B1, and ARID2. So in tumors that have BRAF or RAS mutations and another mutation in one of those genes, um, they fail to redifferentiate uh, re uh, on, on our trials, suggesting that the co-occurring alterations also influence how well redifferentiation works. And when you look at the serial biopsies of, of these patients, you get MAP kinase inhibition in both the responders and, and non-responders. Well, what's different is that in the patient without the spice nip alterations, the re-expression of those genes is successful. Whereas you can see here that it, it failed in the patient with the ERA2 mutation. So what we know is that these genes can lock these patients into refractory transcriptional programs that we cannot reverse with MAP kinase. So when you look at those pieces of data, you say, okay, well, we need better markers of, re -dif of differentiation status to select patients. And we also know that maybe we should exclude certain patients depending upon the co-occurring alterations that they have on their genetic profile. And so that's all I have uh, for, for today. So just in summary, we now have several proof of principle clinical trials and case reports showing that if you match drug to gene type in the RA refractory setting, a subset of patients will have redifferentiation where radioactive iodine can uh, re result in tumor regressions. But as I mentioned, there's, there's still, you know, it's not all patients and we still need to optimize these therapeutic approaches.
We need better predictive markers, whether around the transcriptional level, the genomics level, or other markers to help us identify the patients who will benefit. And of course, if we can find those things in the refractory space, if we were able to do another adjuvant study, those have to be applied in all of those trials. Currently, because ASTRA was negative, the, the, the approach of using rate differentiation in postoperative setting for advent therapy should not be done. There's no known benefit um, based upon the negative results of the phase three study. We have another study that we're analyzing now where we randomized selenomentinib in RI AVID patients and trying to look at the outcomes in that setting. Um, and so we'll be reporting those results soon. But the bottom line is, you know, having done many of these small studies now uh, with multiple groups, what we really need is a demonstration of the long-term benefit and how we're gonna use this in standard of care therapies. Um, and I think ASTRA is an illustration of the importance of doing that. And so one of the things that we're really pushing for is if we're gonna to continue to use these redifferentiation approaches, we really need better and bigger studies to really prove their clinical benefit in specific select circumstances. And so for the ASTRA study, you know, I just want to thank all the investigator and the patients that were really involved. As I mentioned, this was a very tedious and like work intensive uh, trial and the investigators and their teams all worked incredibly hard on this, including AstraZeneca. The analysis of the data was really quite, uh, quite, quite challenging because a lot of the endpoints were novel. And so we had to like look at the data, relook at the data about you know, 50 times. So you know, I appreciate all the help for that trial. I also wanted to um, re-display uh, my disclosures as I was asked to do. And then also for the other studies and, and things that were done in Memorial, our funding support and the multidisciplinary um, interactions that are really required to, 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 to kind of complete these kind of clinical trials. And so I'll stop there and I just thank you for, uh, for your attention. Alan, thank you very much. Um, that was really uh, awesome and um, I think uh, gave some uh, significant clarity to that really important study. Um, we're joined this morning by Dr. Frank Warden. Um, Frank, uh, do you wanna open up the discussion here? Um, yeah, sure. Um, congratulations, Alan. Um, I've you know, heard your, your talks uh, before. Um, you know, it's interesting because as you, you know, talk about this, you know, even presenting the study, my, you know, my first thought was, you know, with the, the BRAF um, mutations and the NRAS mutations, there was going to be, you know, a difference. So I think the first question I would ask is if you were to redesign, you know, the same study, um, you know, it's interesting because it was all based on clinical factors, you know, lymph node involvement, you know, larger tumors were those that were the, you know, had the, the greatest risk for disease, but it really seems biochemically that's where the money is. It, it, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is room to kind of add risk stratification factors that we think are predictive, whether it be postoperative thyroid globulins uh, as well. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, it, what the trial did show was that those pathologic features on their own did select for a higher risk population of patients, but there certainly is always room to kind of further enrich, you know, the patients that who potentially would benefit. Um, and so, you know, and then beyond that, as you mentioned, um, and that was and probably a clear point because of how much time I spend on it is just the <laughs> fact that we have so much better drugs now, you know, and we have so much better approaches um, that the, in addition to kind of how would we modify the patients we selected uh, who are at risk is how we would modify uh, our treatments based upon the, bio the, the known biology of their tumors now. Um, and, right. and, and giving every percentage chance that we get that we be more successful in, re in, in, in enhancing the radioactive ionized effect. Right, right. I think that's, I, I do think that's kind of where, where things are going. You know, like what you had just said too about the promoters that are, you know, contributing to the aggressiveness of the, the tumor in addition to the, you know, the driver mutation. If we can, you know, overcome that, it's almost, in some ways, it's becoming kind of like um, a next generation sequencing for um, redifferentiation, you know, for adding in radioactive iodine. It's almost selecting those patients, treating them with the appropriate drugs, and then, you know, trying the radioactive iodine. You know, the other question I had or, or thought about this is like, you know, now, um, salproketinib, I would say, is not used as much as trimetinib, you know, is, which seems to have a, a little bit better toxicity 
profile overall, you know, because the number of patients that were included because of the, you know, the issues of, you know, toxicity and falling out. Um, do you think that would have contributed perhaps to a better outcome if you had used a drug that was perhaps a little, based on your endpoints that you were, you know, specifying there, um, use a drug that was perhaps a little bit better tolerated if the, the outcomes would have been different? Yeah, I mean, 100%, you know, like, so to kind of get at that, you know, there was, um, there was we, we did do a variety of different subset analyses that were not included in the paper. Um, but if you, if you, A, if you just limited the patient population to those who had all their 18 month assessments as they were planned to do, um, as well as the patients who maintain the, their, themselves on the drug to your point, you know, like, so if you took the toxicity issue out of it, um, there the hazard ratios become much, much higher, you know, like right. in favor of selling that dip. So this is what I'm saying is like, you know, there were a lot of really important lessons learned here. And also, you know, it's also uh, the difference in clinical setting. You know, I think we didn't see as much dropout with our drugs in the R refractory space. But again, those are patients where you can see the tumors, the patients are living with their disease. This is in that post-operative space where the, the benefits by definition are theoretical. So I think, you know, patient's tolerance for like rash and these type of things that you're like, oh, you know, uh, in incurable disease, this is not a big deal when you compare it to TKIs and everything else. In the setting where patients are feeling completely well and don't have evidence of like gross disease, those, those are not tolerable, you know? So I think you're right that the bar for safety has to be much higher in, right. in, in, in that setting. The other side point to back to the other uh, question was, and this was raised uh, during the review of our paper by our reviewers, which I thought was a very salient point is, you know, we don't really have good evidence about the degree of REI sensitivity uh, in this patient population in the post-operative setting, you know? So, you know, a lot of our thoughts are really about how we can boost radioactive ionic efficacy um, but, you know, there may be other mechanisms of resistance here that are not addressed by RA validity that we have to sort of kind of consider. Now, I think it's unlikely that it's a huge proportion of, 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 of these patients because, you know, we've already proven that, you know, in a pretty, you know, a fair uh, proportion of refractory patients, which is the most challenging setting that, you know, if you can modulate avidity, you can get better outcomes. And so I assume that at least at minimum that would happen at post-operative setting, but it is an unanswered question about like, you know, RA avidity. And since you can't really assess avidity in that setting with microscopic disease, right. it's, it's a hard one to kind of ask and answer, but you know, that, 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 that should be on the list of things as you kind of think through, you know, uh, reasons for certain approaches to be successful or not successful. Yeah. Right. You know, it's interesting. It raises another question you know, too. So you approached to me, you know, about participating in this particular study, you know, years ago, and I actually, you know, to help move the field forward, was excited to do it. But when I presented this to my nuclear medicine colleagues, um, there one, you know, the person who was leading our group came back and said, this is unethical. And her concern was that um, at our center at Michigan, for example, we always do an RAI scan, you know, or we do an iodine scan first before we would um, do uh, the radioactive iodine therapy. Yours is really an empiric approach here, you know, treatment and then empirically gives. So do you think there would have been, um, I guess, you know, in some ways I'd like you to comment on that, but, you know, would it have been different, you know, since we, like you just talked about this, we're talking about microscopic disease and not gross disease, would it have been, you know, different had um, the trial been designed where the patients had to have uptake on a scan in order to, you know, have been included and then, you know, repeat yeah. you know what I'm saying, so. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think that would be a very fair study design, honestly, but it, it is a different study design, right? I mean, it's right. no longer it's no longer an adjuvant therapy question. It's right. a kind of like upfront persistent disease question. So um, I think certainly a trial like that would be more than reasonable. It's just that it would be answering and asking a different question. Um, and you know, to your point, you know, and in terms of the other stuff, you know, like in terms of and because of it was an adjuvant question part of the eligibility was that you had to have negative MRI neck and negative CT scan of the chest to, to really yeah. demonstrate you were free of disease. So it was clearly that kind of population, but no, yeah. I mean, I think if, if there was a protocol where we're saying post-operatively you have persistent disease that was REI avid does, 
selling men have add anything there, that would be totally reasonable. To the other point about Advent, I mean, we routinely use radioactive iodine for both ablation and for, you know, theoretical um, uh, Advent therapy, um, you know, without any prospective data. I mean, there is no data to support that, you know, that has been done on a clinical right. trial, <laughs> right. which, was, which was one of the problems for, uh, for us when we were designing this, because there's no historical, there wasn't Correct. a reliable historical standard. So our standard of care is using an approach that hasn't been validated by a prospective trial. Right. Um, so, you know, that was, that was sort of the conundrum. And it was also one of the reasons why, you know, um, you, that we thought there was going to be value in doing this as well, is that it just to simply, you know, verify that we could identify the patients where this, uh, where more treatment was required, you know? So, yeah. Um, but that's, that's why in my, in my view, if we can, you know, design things um, that are that have ethical equipoise. Uh, we got to do more trials because you know, otherwise, um, you know, we really don't know what the outcomes of these are. Whether it's redifferentiation, whether it's radioactive iodine, et, et cetera. Um, right. And so, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's interesting too. So um, Megan Hamer uh, published um, Jennifer Griggs, you know, a few years back about the use of RAI, and it kind of depends on what you know zip code you live in, basically. Yes. I mean, that, yes. that you know, people who um, are high risk disease, there are a large number of those patients who don't get RAI, and yes. vice versa. That people who have low risk disease, you know, who are actually probably getting it or over getting it. So. Um, being, you know, with that in mind, you know, you should be congratulated. So yeah, the study is negative. We all like positive studies and, you know, negative studies, unfortunately have the chance, you know, the tendency kind of get dismissed. Like that just doesn't work. But I think the points that you bring out and what I'd really like to say, congratulations to you is like, look, we did a study that was um, in a population where we don't know a lot of, you know, standards that are really set, like you just mentioned, but also a difficult study to do with a multidisciplinary group. So what it shows is that we can do this. We just need to refine it to find, you know, what is the best population to treat. So we can make a difference, you know, for yeah, some yeah. of these patients. So yeah, I, yeah go ahead. Sorry. No, there, and there's, there's no question that there's so many different, as, as we kind of listed out areas that uh, the design could and should be improved. Um, and updated with like, you know, um, our, you know, our uh, ongoing knowledge about how, how these things work. Um, but what I don't want it to shy away from is, is, to, is that point is that um, this means that we shouldn't be doing trials. I mean, I, I don't think that that should be the takeaway, you know. Um, I think it, it just means that we have to kind of learn from, uh, you know, the flaws in the original studies and kind of redesign better ones. Um, and, you know, at least for this, if there was ever interest in doing it, at least we know that there is a target to hit, you know, like um, right. that's acceptable to the FDA and that, you know, uh, but I think the other thing is making sure it is reassessing exactly like what your group did, which is reassessing, does this um, have a meaningful clinical benefit from, from the perspective of the investigators and the treating physicians? Um, and of course, uh, that all has to be true. Um, so yeah, I I I no, I I agree with that point. Yeah, um, there is a question in the chat here about um, skin reaction to selumetinib in the Astra study. Why do you think this happened? That that's a class effect of MEK inhibitors. Um, yeah. So up to, up to half of them will have this acne or foam rash. Um, yes. And um, now we have lower rates of it um, because you know sometimes we prophylax with. Um, uh, with um, uh, with antibiotics that can kind of decrease the severity or frequency, but that's a known side effect of the class. Um, um, but like to your point about sulfurcatnib, you know, if we could find different approaches that match the drugs better to the genotype and then are much better tolerated, I think you know that that is going to be a one critical component that we're going to have to improve on. Right, I I totally agree with that. I mean, it's interesting, you know, now that in the, the BRAF population, like in anaplastics, how, you know, trimetinib is, you know, now like an FDA approved yeah. agent in that um, it just seems like the side effect profile of that particular drug, when I use it as compared to, you know, the selumetinib when we've used that is much, you know, better tolerated. So yeah. I think there is that to your point about, you know, finding the drugs so that like you said, cause you're doing this in a curative setting or you don't want to hurt people <laughs> by right. any stretch of the means, right. um, you know, so that, that may, and, and reasonably so they're 
thresholds for what to accept are are much are much correct. Higher. So I think absolutely, which, which is all fair. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, to kind of finish, you know, up here, I guess you know the question I'd ask is. Um, where right now, you know, this is, a, you know, a negative study and we obviously need to do other studies. Where do you see a role for, um, using, um, you know, like a MEK inhibitor or a BRAF inhibitor yeah. in, um, a, a radioactive iodine refractory population? Are there people that come to your clinic, for example, that you would say, you know, let's give you a little bit of bemurafenib, um, mm -hmm. Trimetinib or salpicatinib, and then yeah. send you back to the the uh, nuclear medicine doctor and and see if we yeah. get you know um, stimulated scans that show that you can get some more treatment. So yeah, how should we finish that? Yeah, I mean I think it's an open question because in all honesty, for me, um, it's been an easy approach because we've done all of most of my um, every patient I've treated has been on for clinical trial. You know. Um, yeah. And so that's what I was kind of alluding to in terms of longer term outcomes is doing a study that defines that benefit. Um, in my view, like, you know, one of the potential benefits of the approach is treating these patients so they don't need TKI or defer the need for TKI. Correct. And so when you think about a trial that to prove that point is, well, giving them redifferentiation and then what's the time to TKI interval after that. But that's a very subjective endpoint, which makes that a very difficult study. The other way right. that I've seen people use it um, and that I think also may have value is patients who are on TKIs, maybe on a BRAF inhibitor or something, but they're having a tough time with toxicities and they're taking frequent breaks and then using redifferentiation on the back end to say, okay, we'll give you, uh, you know, a dose of radioactive iodine and take you off treatment and like use that as a, a way to sustain benefit. And so, you know, there are trial designs that we've discussed where, you know, comparing BRAF inhibitor alone, continuous therapy as part of standard of care versus BRAF inhibitor intermittent with radioactive iodine and comparing the outcomes in that setting, you know? Yeah. So those are the two settings that I, I see it most frequently used and potentially could have benefit. But the issue of course is we, we need the trials to prove that, you know, like, you know, we need the trials to prove that that benefit right. exists. Um, so, when we use it off label, it's really kind of like very pragmatic concerns, like someone who you want to treat, but they can't be on sustained continuous therapy for whatever reason. Or, yeah. or, or that that example, that latter example I, I, I mentioned. Uh, so I'm pretty selective actually in the end because um, you know I'd rather do it on a trial where where you know the benefits right. of being uh, being, a, being being evaluated. You know? Right, I would agree with that. You know, it's interesting too, like in your article um, with the BF. BRAF, you know, inhibitors, and then going on to uh, treat with RAI, you know, the point, um, I remember the data you presented, I think maybe at ITOG, that those that were more differentiated as compared to those, you know, 50% of those PTC patients that become more poorly differentiated or even yeah. undifferentiated seem to do better. And, yes. um, and I think that's kind of with this whole, you know, selective um, idea that I think if you're going to do this, you know, with RAI, it probably is more of those patients who are maybe slowly progressing, but progressing versus patients who are, you know, all of a sudden having lymphangitic spread or more, you know, shortness of breath, yeah. and bone metastases, things yeah. like that. Yeah. And, and other factors like kind of, you know, relative factors we think about is patients who have been already been exposed to TKIs, they have more advanced disease, they don't respond as well. People who's, and this was published right. in, in the Tremendna paper by the, by the German group that hot, really high FDG avidity does not speak well to like redifferentiation outcomes. But as I kind of showed you in that, in, in, in that, in that slide, it, for BRAF mutant disease at least, their differentiation status is not delineated by their RI avidity. All of them have negative, right? a completely yeah. negative uptake, but yet some respond and some don't. And that just right. speaks to the fact that we need better markers, you know, whether it's the co-occurring genetic alterations, whether it's the thyroglobulin or like some other novel test to really be able to delineate that. Yeah. Right, right. Because like sometimes you treat these people, I, I treated them with the, like a fat nib in combination with dibrafenib, for example, and had this yeah, guy with yeah. this amazing response. I mean, complete yeah, yeah. response in the neck and then his lymphogenic disease went away and he still you know, three years out, and then you do the same thing in another patient and you may get a little benefit and then all of a sudden it progresses, again. you know, yeah. so 
yeah, I agree with you totally that you, the importance of finding the genetic alterations that are you know contributing to the the, the driver mutation are absolutely yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, we got to move beyond the drivers at this point. You know, I think um, exactly it, we've kind of done what we can with that, uh, and now it's about how other things modify. The problem, of course, is it becomes much more complicated after that. But it's, right, but it's <laughs> right, like, exactly. But yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, well, I think Frank, this is a great discussion. So yeah, um, Frank. Yeah, yeah, one last one last question. We're up against the nine o'clock hour. Maybe if um, Alan or both of you could just comment for the audience to take away from this session: um, Is this the population uh, that we should be directing our efforts um, at at ten thousand feet? Should we be targeting this group that are at risk but don't have evidence of disease for adjuvant therapy? How do you how do you think about that, and what's kind of the take home message here? I think well, for me, the take home message is that there you know there is an ability to select a patient population for whom they do not achieve complete remission, and that there would be a benefit to improving the rates of complete remission in that population. Now, if there are other factors that we can throw into there to identify even a poor risk population. I think that there is there is benefit, but there's enough work to be done in a lot of different settings that that doesn't have to be the only setting that we're we're focused on, you know. So, to to um, you know uh, to the to the prior point about uh, persistent disease, to RA refractory disease and RA avid ad disease, but I I would put this on the list of of clinical settings where there could potentially be good clinical benefit if we selected the right patients. And I think Astra is the starting point. That's not the end point. It's the starting point. Yeah. Great. And I would agree with that wholeheartedly that really, as Alan had mentioned a couple of times here, that these are clinical questions in the context of, of, of well-designed studies. So if we have the opportunity to put patients on studies, that's how we will learn. So just to randomly take people and say, oh, I think you're high-risk disease, we should treat you with an adjuvant, you know, MEK inhibitor followed by RAI, I don't think it is warranted until yeah. we have good data to say this is the population who really does need to be treated. Yeah, as a takeaway, I would never do that. <laughs> exactly. That. Exactly. exactly. Like, that's, that's my point. So is that, yeah. You know, don't do yeah, this at home. Do right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Great. Well, listen, thank you both. I uh, greatly appreciate your time and effort. We have gone over as I expected. Um, thank you to all of our viewers and hope you'll join us again next week. But um, thank you all for, uh, uh, for for coming on board, and um, as as you know, uh, these will this session will be available by video um, uh, come the beginning of next week. So, Alan, uh, Frank, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks thank for you. the invitation. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, thank you. yeah, good to see you guys. All right, take care. Yeah, Great. bye bye. Bye bye. -bye.